Good day, everyone, and Happy New Year. Um, I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Southern California, and I'd like to welcome to you to the next webinar on Big Data to Knowledge, Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. We're absolutely delighted to have Dr. Ian Foster from the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratories here to discuss why the cloud matters for data science. Uh, Dr. Foster is a well-regarded computer scientist based at the University of Chicago, where he is a professor of computer science and he's also the director of data science in the data science and learning division and distinguished fellow at Argonne National Laboratory. He received his bachelor's degree from the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and his PhD from Imperial College in London, England, um, both for computer science. And he is well known for his work on the development of grid computing, of the Globus network, of, uh, of how to um, move data around efficiently on the internet. And his work involves developing tools and techniques which allow people to use high performance computing technologies to do quantitative things new and easily. Um, we really like to welcome uh, Dr. Foster and I'd like to welcome you, the, the audience, to uh, text in um, and submit your questions via the little question submission system here. Uh, and uh, I will uh, uh, work to uh, gather those up and ask them on your behalf of Dr. Foster uh, towards the end of the hour. Uh, without further ado, though, I'd like to turn the, uh, the webinar over to Dr. Foster to tell us why the cloud matters for data science. Uh, Ian, the stage is yours. Thank you, Jack. Um, good uh, morning, um, good afternoon for those on the East Coast. Um, thanks for joining. Um, so yeah, what I want to do today is uh, talk to you about uh, cloud uh, and hopefully uh, tell you a few things that you don't know about it um, uh, and uh, you know, give you an idea of why it is important. Uh, I think a very you know, fundamentally tr transformative um, technology that we should all be uh, deeply familiar with and and in some cases you know working out how to uh, apply in in our science so my uh first uh so that's me um my first slide here uh, quotes a, a few interesting uh, assertions I, I guess uh, by uh, the gartner group about cloud computing this is from a fairly recent uh, report of theirs uh, and it has some interesting observations. Uh, you know, the first bullet there asserts that you know, many large enterprises uh, will be you know, moving to largely cloud-only strategies for new IT. In other words, they'll be deploying new data systems, computing systems, and so forth, not in-house, but on resources provided by companies like Amazon or Google or Microsoft. Um, that uh, increasingly those applications are going to be mission critical, um, that they're going to be moving, getting more tech specific, moving towards uh, using uh, container rather than virtual machines to host uh, things. And we'll say a little bit, little bit about that later. Um, that they'll increasingly be using uh, AI uh, technologies, uh, learning uh, and data science technologies uh, that are, will increasingly be cloud hosted and um, starting to use uh, a technology called uh, cloud native, native uh, serverless computing, which I'll say a bit more about as well, because I think it's significant and when we think about how we might create data science uh, applications that we intend to scale to, uh, to large numbers of users. So let's, so that's sort of just a, by, by way of background. Um, now let's uh, move on and, and spend a bit of time talking about what uh, cloud computing is uh, and, and how one might be able to use it. So, uh, you know, first of all, perhaps though, to spend a minute saying, well, why is it that uh, cloud computing is able to do um, uh, all these wonderful things? Why is it that people, at least in enterprises, are looking so seriously at running uh, large uh, and complex applications on cloud computing? Well, first of all, it's uh, you know, due to uh, co the economies of scale that are inherent in the extremely uh, large deployments that uh, uh, are operated by uh, cloud uh, providers. So this, I think, is a, a Google machine room, um, I think, near Chicago. Um, but, you know, there are many of these uh, warehouse scale computing systems being 
uh, operated by um, a growing number of, of companies. And uh, well, it's just, it's sort of a fascinating picture. You can see the uh, enormous sizes uh, that they are able to, uh, to operate and, and therefore the, and that translates uh, into uh, certainly issues of scalability, uh, economies of scale in terms of operations, uh, also uh, reliability uh, and um, and less uh, obviously perhaps uh, also has implications for things like security. Uh, you've got very uh, dedicated professional staff operating and ensuring the security of this sort of system. So arguably cloud computing systems are more secure than whatever might be uh, operated by your home institution. Um, when people use the word cloud, I just mentioned briefly to refer to uh, um, a variety of different technologies. Uh, you'll hear people talking about private clouds or academic or community clouds. These tend to be uh, clusters uh, operated uh, inside a, uh, a machine room at an institution running certain software that will allow uh, access to uh, uh, certain storage uh, models and, and computing models. Um, but mostly I'm going to be talking today about public cloud, which is the sorts of systems that I just showed you a picture of. And, and I think it's an important distinction. Public cloud tends to have a, a far richer uh, set of services. Um, and it's those services that I think are, are really part of the what makes cloud computing exciting. Um, so that, let's spend a minute now talking about what the cloud is. So in my view, uh, you can think of cloud computing as providing three different capabilities or sets of capabilities to users. One that we're probably many of us are familiar with um, is, is you can think of the cloud as a virtual computer. It's something that lets you uh, run a virtual machine or store a file, uh, run many virtual machines, store many files. Um, but doing so, you know, just the things you do on your on your workstation or uh, institutional computer, but doing it uh, in the machine room like the one that I, I just showed you. And of course that has uh, you know, certain uh, benefits. We, we can, for example, uh, deploy uh, a virtual machine and run an application that uh, perhaps uh, requires more resources than we have available locally. Um, perhaps that you know, uses a specialized uh, hardware uh, device like a graphical processing unit, GPU, that we don't have available locally. But it's really not fundamentally different from uh, what we do in our uh, ordinary everyday uh, computing. Uh, the second uh, model of cloud computing um, is as what you might call a lab assistant. Um, you know, a, a, it's a, a set of uh, software services that um, uh, does things that uh, you know, we could do ourselves locally, but is perhaps uh, more useful to do uh, or more efficient uh, to do um, re remotely. So we, we all make use of the sort of software as a service side of cloud computing every day. If we use uh, Google Docs or uh, Google Mail or um, some travel uh, uh, planning service uh, and so on and so forth. And, and there are uh, you know a growing number also of more scientific uh, software as a service offerings uh, available. I won't, we'll, we'll cover some of those a bit locally a bit later. And then thirdly, and this is perhaps the most uh, interesting part of cloud computing, um, is it's, it's increasingly a, a programming platform. It's uh, a set of platform services, and we'll go through what some of those are a little bit later, um, with very rich and powerful platform services that we can use to build our own uh, very interesting applications uh, often more quickly, uh, more reliably, uh, more securely than we might be able to do if we built them locally. Um, and we might run those applications on the cloud itself, as I sort of show in the bottom uh, lower right here, or we might build applications that run on, on our in our own lab, but that happen to use some of these platform services to uh, for example, manage workflows or store results of, of computations. And th those hybrid sorts of things are often uh, very interesting. Now, uh, so, so here's uh, just to give you an idea of 
you know, when I say that there's a lot of platform services, this is a, a, a figure uh, that shows the platform services provided by one particular cloud vendor, uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, and I won't go through them here in any detail, but you'll, well, certainly you'll get the idea that there's a lot of them. Um, you'll see they cover yeah, topics like compute and storage, uh, certainly. Um, but also uh, other areas like uh, content delivery, workflow management, uh, notification services, monitoring. Uh, in fact, this is only a subset of all the services that uh, Amazon provides. And people are starting to use these sorts of services to, to write some very interesting uh, data science uh, applications. Um, and I may, may have time to say a bit about those uh, later. And uh, you know, just a one thing that uh, this emergence of this new programming platform, if you like, ha has spurred is an incredible variety of uh, software as a service capabilities. So these, uh, this is a, actually quite an old slide. It's uh, six years old. Uh, the Bessemer uh, venture capital firm hasn't created a new version of it uh, recently, at least not in this format. But now, this was a, uh, you know, their attempt to uh, capture, as I said, the top 300 uh, companies that were providing various forms of software as a service or platform as a service um, capabilities uh, to to, uh, to enterprises. Of course, a few of these uh, are, are relevant to uh, science. Most of them are not. Hopefully, uh, I believe we're going to see uh, an emergence of uh, a more scientifically focused. Uh, software and platform as a service uh, offerings uh, in the in the coming years. Now, um, I mentioned in the abstract uh, for the tutorial for the for this lecture and, and I'll mention here, um, I, myself and my colleague Dennis Gannon recently uh, produced a, a book on cloud computing for science and engineering that really goes far more deeply than I can in this uh, in this uh, hour uh, or so. Um, into this question of what cloud computing is and how it can be used for science and engineering. So I'm going to use a variety of uh, components from that book as I proceed uh, through the rest of this uh, lecture. And I should um, you know, emphasize that uh, this is not just a, a, uh, a bad sales job. Um, you can buy this book, but uh, the contents are all uh, also all entirely online um, at cloudforsciench.org. So you're able to enjoy it without um, uh, purchasing uh, the, the book, although it, it does, does make a nice uh, uh, present for your, for your family and so forth. Anyway, so let me just uh, show you what goes into the uh, online um, system because it has a couple of interesting features. So of course, we've got the, uh, the contents of the book um, and uh, you know, available and something that looks uh, quite pleasant. And you'll see the sort of what the topics we cover and these are the topics that I'm going to review very briefly in this in this uh, lecture. You know how you use the cloud as a platform, uh, sorry, as as a virtual computer. How you manage data in the cloud, how you can compute in the cloud, uh, and then how you use the cloud as platform. Um, how you may the services that are available for things like data analytics, streaming, machine learning. Um, uh, I'll say a bit about uh, something called the Globus Research Data Management Platform, which is cloud hosted in is often used in science. Uh, I won't talk today, but the book does talk a bit about how to build your own cloud, you know, how to uh, configure a, a cluster of your own to run uh, some of these uh, data management and computing management services. And, and there's also, I won't also talk today about security and privacy, but there's a, a lot of uh, material uh, in the book on that. And of course, that's a very important topic uh, for many purposes. Um, so that's uh, that's the content of the book. The, the other interesting thing here, and I'd really like to just convey it to you briefly, is uh, we have a set of uh, Jupyter notebooks. Hopefully, uh, many of you are familiar with Jupyter, you know, a web-based uh, interactive uh, computing environment. Uh, so we have some 23, I think it is, uh, Jupyter notebooks that allow you to, uh, uh, you know, try, well, observe or experiment with uh, 
um, develop applications using the the various uh, technologies that are described in the, in this book. And you know, this is what a Jupyter notebook looks like for those of you uh, who are not familiar with it. Uh, here we're using it to run uh, Python. We use Python really for all of the examples in the book, pretty much. Um, and uh, you know, just very briefly. Uh, Jupyter Notebook has a series of cells, each of which contain Python code, and you can run these cells uh, uh, in lo online, uh, you know, using using your web, web browser, and uh, you create in li inline graphics, or uh, as we often do, manipulate um, yeah, and access cloud computing services to do things like retrieve data, store data, run computing, and, and so forth. Okay, so let me. Uh, to spend a few minutes now talking about some of the uh, capabilities that you're going to get from uh, cloud computing at the infrastructure level. Uh, the cloud is virtual computer. Uh, so what does your uh, desktop computer provide to you? It provides computing and storage. I mean, it does other things uh, because, of course, of the software that it runs, but computing and storage are the two fundamental capabilities. And similarly, uh, cloud computing providers uh, offer a uh, actually a very rich set of you know, storage as a service uh, uh, options. Uh, and these uh, implement, as we show here, are a variety of different uh, storage models. There's certainly uh, file system models so that uh, you can read and write files um, just as you would on your uh, desktop machine. Um, but there are also uh, uh, other uh, important uh, uh, storage models offered as well. So object storage uh, is probably the, you know, the most, was the first cloud storage service provided by Amazon some quite a few years ago now, and is one of the most uh, popular. It's uh, important, um, it, it's important relate, relates to the fact that it's uh, highly scalable, reliable, um, and uh, and uh, relatively uh, inexpensive compared to, to compared to some of the others. Um, but as well as object storage, which we'll say more about in a minute, there's uh, you know they provide relational uh, database services, no, no SQL database services, graph database services, uh, warehouse analytic services, and so forth. Um, what I'm showing here in in terms of uh, each of these columns is um, you know, what offerings each of the three major cloud vendors uh, provides, um, Amazon, Google, and Azure. And you'll see that they, they all have uh, often very similar, sometimes rather different uh, versions of these capabilities. So uh, you know it, it's not unusual now to see people building uh, data analytics services that uh, maintain the data that's being manipulated in uh, an object store or a relational uh, data service. Um, you know, compute on the data uh, on cloud, uh, and then write results back to uh, to other cloud services uh, for for, the, for for further computing. And we'll see examples of that uh, in, in a second. A few words about um, objects, uh, the object storage model. The basic idea is uh, similar across all systems. Your uh, storage universe is. Uh, divided up into uh, buckets uh, called sometimes that or containers that are sometimes called uh, buckets um, and within uh, a bucket you can uh, place uh, you know, often very large numbers of uh, objects and the uh, storage system the, the cloud service then provides uh, application programming interfaces uh, and uh, other methods for putting things into uh, containers, for retrieving them from, from containers, for associating attributes with, uh, with uh, containers, uh, and, and so forth. So, uh, well, we'll, come, we'll see an example of that in a minute. Um, but yeah, you know, one, one other thing we're showing here is that uh, one thing that containers, uh, objects stores commonly support is, uh, is some form of versioning, which can be uh, important uh, of course, if you uh, are concerned about reproducible science and being able to uh, track uh, changes to your data over time. So that's the object model. Um, I'll just show briefly how it is realized uh, in, in one particular uh, cloud uh, service, um, uh, Amazon. Uh, and I use this example really to also convey another 
notion, which is that most of the services that uh, cloud providers offer support both web interfaces for you know interactive use. So at the top here, I'm uh, creating a new bucket called Cloud for Science. Uh, you'll see that I uh, get uh, am asked where I want to create it. Um, you know, I can place it. There are different uh, data centers often op operated by cloud providers and depending on where I think most of the accesses will come, I may, may place it in one location or another. Um, and of course, uh, being able to use a web interface is often a very nice way of manipulating uh, things. But then uh, typically there are uh, application programming interfaces uh, and software development kits that allow me to do anything I can do with a web interface and often more uh, programmatically. So I'm down the bottom, I've got some Python code that's basically doing the same thing um, as I just showed here. Well, first of all, I delete the bucket I just created uh, with the rest with the uh, with the web uh, you know, interface, and then I create it, uh, you know, specifying uh, that I want it located in the U.S. standard region, and then I uh, put an ob put an object uh, into that newly created bucket. So you can do some uh, amazingly uh, sophisticated things using fairly simple uh, Python code. So, uh, so that's it. we won't. I won't say more about storage. There are some other wonderful storage services. Let me say a bit about uh, computing in the cloud now. Um, so, uh, and I'll sort of just summarize some of the key concepts by uh, showing the table of contents um, from the online book. So, computing as a service. Uh, at the most fundamental level uh, is offered uh, typically in, in the in the form of either virtual machines or containers. So, and I'll say more about the, the difference between those in a minute. Um, uh, serverless computing, I'll also say more about uh, a little bit further on. Um, but uh, you know, each cloud service offers uh, mechanisms that allow you to create virtual machines create one instance of a virtual machine 10 100 a thousand uh configured with whatever software you want um and, and then uh, there are uh, various also services that let you manage large numbers of such uh virtual machines um for example you may run map reduce computations across them uh, you might run a define a computing graph or workflow that runs on them uh, you can also run message passing interface uh, computations uh, ac across them. Um, the cloud systems don't tend to uh, offer the ultra high speed uh, communication interfaces that might be required for high performance computing style parallelism at very large scales, but they seem to do reasonably well uh, up to at least a few hundred. Uh, nodes in many cases, which is often all that one needs for one's uh, for one's uh, scientific applications, unless you're dealing with extremely large uh, scale simulations. Um, so those are some of the concepts. I think you'll serverless is sort of special, and we'll come back to that. But the rest of them are the sorts of things that you might reasonably do on your own local uh, computing uh, uh, so computing system. Um, a little bit about uh, Virtual machines uh, versus uh, containers. Perhaps uh, many of you are familiar with the distinctions here. Uh, you know, a container is, in some sense, a uh, more lightweight uh, version of a virtual machine. A virtual machine, of course, is something that lets you uh, run uh, a particular application and a particular set of libraries and a particular operating system on a computer without having to uh, you know have that computer dedicated to, to that to that operating system so if your uh, software is designed to run on uh, a particular version of Linux um, uh, or a particular version of Windows you can stand up a virtual machine uh, with that uh, software including the operating system um, uh, deployed uh, and, and ready to go and uh, you know containers, work in a similar fashion except uh, the they organize themselves slightly differently um, uh, internally and as the table at the bottom you know points out uh, your containers 
are being increasingly used for uh, well for many things, but including uh, data science because they're more lightweight. Um, they can be deployed very rapidly. They can be created and destroyed uh, rapidly, and um, for various reasons, they are uh, quite portable from one uh, cloud cloud to another, thanks to uh, technologies like uh, Docker and, and Singularity, which I won't say more about. Um, so uh, just to point out that uh, as with storage, um, so with computing, uh, the cloud providers uh, offer web interfaces that let you, you know, start and manage uh, instances. So here I'm uh, looking at uh, a Amazon uh, compute uh, virtual machine uh, uh, interface. Uh, and you can see I've got um, you know, what well, three uh, virtual machine instances, uh, two are stopped, one is running. In fact, it's in the middle of initializing. And I could launch additional ones uh, if I wanted. So just with a click of a button, I can create a new uh, computing system. And of course, if I don't want to click buttons, then as with storage, I can also uh, create instances uh, using, uh, uh, for example, a Python uh, API. So down the bottom here, I'm uh, creating one instance uh, of a particular type, uh, micro type, so a very, not very powerful instance, um, using a specified uh, virtual machine image in the US West uh, uh, region. They could also be creating a thousand um, instances of uh, very uh, powerful computers um, uh, using the same uh, same API. Um, so, give you a, a feeling for what um, the sorts of things uh, that you can do with these capabilities. So, here's a um, this is a, a, a pipeline developed um, by a, a group at uh, Chicago working with people at uh, USC and uh, uh, ISB in, in Seattle. Um, so it's concerned with, uh, so what they wanted to do was, um, I won't go into the technical details, but um, to run a computational process that would um, find a potential uh, uh, trans trans transcription factor binding sites uh, within uh, large amounts of DNA's seq uh, data from ENCODE. Um, and uh, you know the pipeline involved uh, running various uh, popular uh, applications, uh, the Snap Aligner, uh, um, the FSeq uh, uh, tool, a couple of different uh, footprint um, finding uh, applications, um, and running this over uh, actually large amounts, you know, terabytes of, of data. Um, Actually, it's more tens of gigabytes of data, but uh, producing along the way terabytes of of, of data um, from the uh, as a side effect of the computation. So this is something that would be pretty hard to run on one's uh, desktop uh, or even you know in a typical lab. But because we use Amazon Web Services, we can fire this up uh, on uh, many multi-core nodes and, and run the whole thing in a, in a couple of hours, I think, uh, using, in this case, 74 node hours, 740 node hours uh, during computation. And then the results, uh, the data come is retrieved from the ENCODE system. Uh, it's uh, um, the results are eventually de deployed onto Amazon storage. Um, so uh, as in a typical many scientific applications, we are using a mix of cloud and non-cloud computing resources to do what we want to do. Um, I just mentioned very briefly that uh, for those uh, in the scientific uh, space who are interested in working with uh, cloud computing um, but don't want to use public cloud resources for a number of uh, academic cloud uh, providers that one can work with. Um, you know, perhaps the most uh, accessible is uh, Jetstream. It's operate, operated by the uh, National Science Foundation or operated for the National Science Foundation by the University of uh, Indiana. Um, so jetstreamcloud.org, you can uh, head there and uh, request, uh, I think, a startup account quite easily. And then uh, you can do the sorts of things I've been showing uh, already. Um, you know, create a virtual machine, uh, create containers, uh, store data, 
uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, my uh, research group at Chicago uses this quite a bit and they find it uh, very, very easy to, to, to work with. Okay, so that's um, a few words about the cloud as a virtual computer, a place where you can store data and compute. Uh, but what I, I think makes the cloud really exciting uh, is its, uh, is its uh, capabilities in terms of uh, platform. So what do I mean by a platform here? It's uh, a set of services that cloud providers operate that you can access via APIs and therefore integrate into your applications, um, uh, which may run either locally or remotely, um, you know, either on the cloud or on your own uh, computer, uh, to do things that would be very uh, perhaps difficult for you to do uh, uh, locally. So, you know, I guess the the storage services we've already talked about already have a sort of a platform uh, characteristic. You know, if I want to uh, write an application that runs on my uh, in my lab and s stores all the data coming off my instruments into a uh, object store and while indexing them in a relational da database, I can do that via a simple Python script that uh, calls suitable cloud storage uh, APIs. Um, but the, the services that we describe uh, in this slide and the next one actually allow us to do a lot more than simply um, store data. So let me say a, just a, say a few words about each of them. So uh, there's a, a variety of uh, data analytics services. Um, you know, some of these are simply things that let you run uh, MapReduce computations or Spark Apache Spark computations. So, computations that perform parallel uh, analyses of uh, large quantities of data. Um, there are other services um, like Google Cloud Data Lab and Amazon Athena Analytics that provide more sophisticated built-in analytic capabilities. Um, there's a very rich set of uh, services off offered by various providers that deal with uh, data streaming. Um, you know, so data coming off a uh, scientific instrument, you might set up uh, a streaming uh, service that would uh, re receive each image as it uh, is produced. Um, and then uh, does something with it, you know, perhaps processes it, uh, stores the results uh, in, a, in a database, uh, notifies people that uh, it's available. Those are the sorts of things that one can uh, implement very easily using things like Google Dataflow, uh, Kafka, Kinesis uh, you know, from Amazon and, and other such of services. I may say a bit more about that later if, if time permits. And then uh, there's a, a, a growing set of uh, very powerful uh, machine learning services um, being provided by uh, actually all of the uh, major cloud providers. Um, and uh, I think this is a particularly exciting uh, set of uh, capabilities for various reasons. Well, in particular, because uh, you know, good machine learning often requires uh, access to uh, powerful computing capabilities, um, specialized capabilities like. Uh, GPUs, graphical processing units, large amounts of data, uh, large uh, quantities of computing. And these are all uh, easily accessible, uh, of course, uh, uh, you know, for, for a price, and never needless to say, uh, on these uh, commercial cloud uh, providers. Um, and they also uh, you know, come uh, provide those computing resources uh, along with uh, pre configured. Uh, um, software to uh, that you know, implements uh, various uh, uh, machine learning methods, um, and you know, partly that's is possible because there is such a rich uh, collection of uh, open source uh, software for uh, uh, various forms of machine learning, deep learning, and, and other uh, similar techniques. Um, and partly because these cloud vendors see this as uh, a differentiator, so they're constantly competing to try and offer the best uh, set of the such software on their platforms. So uh, you know, down the bottom, I just described briefly uh, one of the, the services that uh, Amazon offers. offers. You know, it has a pre-configured virtual machine image, um, which uh, implements a variety of different uh, um, 
Uh, AMI, by the way, is uh, Amazon uh, Machine Image. Um, so they have a deep learning AMI, which includes a whole range of different uh, platforms, uh, lots of examples and so forth. Uh, and so we can fairly quickly uh, you know, run through and uh, apply some of these uh, these methods. So, um, you know, one of the notebooks that we supply, number 21, uh, we we uh, use this to uh, see what happens when we try and apply um, a pre-trained model, a model that's been trained on a large uh, publicly uh, available uh, ImageNet the data set, the data set is called ImageNet, to some uh, biological images. So uh, I won't go through all of the code, it's only uh, you know, 50 lines or so of, of code that sets this up, it loads in the ImageNet uh, data, it uh, loads in the ImageNet uh, model, uh, and then we uh, apply this to uh, four uh, images that we uh, fed to the resulting um, uh, model. Um, and so uh, what you'll see, we've got some yeast, uh, a bacteria, um, an amoeba, and a seahorse. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, we're not just, we're taking the uh, pre-trained model that's been trained on public data. It isn't particularly uh, specialized for biology, but nevertheless, you'll see, uh, you know, they come up with a set of, um, uh, labels for these images along with their uh, uh, some measure of their confidence uh, and uh, well, you'll see the top rating for each of them uh, is uh, actually correct um, so they all do well uh, the yeast um, and seahorse uh, their confidence is less high but nevertheless it, it does you know show you uh, that with uh, essentially you know no uh, effort, um, it's possible to apply some quite sophisticated machine learning techniques to uh, to data. I mean, I could be running this uh, labeling system on uh, data coming out of a, a lab, and you know, sometimes it might uh, provide some, some useful capabilities. Of course, we if we were doing this seriously, we'd look for other uh, versions of this uh, network that have been trained perhaps with more uh, larger quantities of more biologically relevant data. But nevertheless, um, we can do very well uh, just uh, out of the gate. Now, uh, let me mention uh, something else that I, I think is important about cloud computing, and this is uh, how uh, one may develop applications for, for cloud uh, platforms. So we've seen, um, you know, I've talked briefly about virtual machines, shows how you stand up a virtual machine. Um, this virtual machine can contain just uh, a uh, you know your, the software that you would normally run on your workstation. Um, it might you know run an application that simply reads in some data, uh, applies some data analytics function to it, and writes out the results. And you know, that is basically doing what we would do at home, but doing it in the cloud instead of uh, locally. And we might be doing that for reasons of scalability or or access to specialized resources. But uh, increasingly, people are developing applications on the cloud in, in a rather different manner. And I think it's important to understand that if you start thinking about using cloud for, for your own uh, purposes. And uh, what they're doing is um, building what people call cloud native uh, applications. Um, and this picture down here really shows uh, what's, in, what's involved. So on the left, we have, uh, you know, how we might build a, an application on a you know, desktop, perhaps, uh, or you can, or on the cloud. Um, you know, have a set of virtual machines uh, or containers, um, each of which has some data in it uh, and some computing logic. And, uh, you know, they do whatever our data analytic uh, uh, or other uh, uh, computations that we want to perform. Um, so these are, uh, systems are what we call stateful. Uh, you know, e each of these virtual machines has its own local file system in which it's uh, storing uh, data. If it wants to communicate data to another virtual machine, perhaps it writes it to a shared file system or sends it a message or something. Um, but uh, reliability of these sorts of applications is potentially ch challenging because of course, if your virtual machine fails, uh, then uh, you've, um, you've lost uh, the data that was stored in it. So that's not, not ideal. Uh, a cloud native application 
will typically uh, be structured in, in this sort of format. All state, you know, the, the data you're analyzing, the results of an analysis, and so forth, are stored uh, in um, some uh, cloud uh, storage service. And these are, you know, are designed to be highly reliable. They'll replicate data across multiple ge geographic regions. So they'll maintain multiple copies of d data and they'll you know, keep track of which copies are, are up to date and so forth. Um, and then the computation is performed by, uh, you know, stateless computation, stateless uh, services that might uh, get created just for the purpose of, uh, of performing your analysis. Um, if they fail, no problem, you simply rerun the uh, analysis. Um, and this uh, has a number of advantages. It's the resulting systems are more, uh, are more reliable. Um, they can also be uh, more easily scaled up and down, you know, as the amount of computation that needs to be performed uh, changes over time. So I have a, this is a quite an old um, example, but I still think it's a very good one. This is uh, the, the structures used by an application called Animoto. Uh, if, I don't know if you, any of you have heard of it. It's a system that takes a set of slides, or no, sorry, pictures, and creates a, a little music video uh, with the pictures that you provide to it. So no scientific interest, um, but uh, in a sense, it's not a typical of many data analysis applications in science. You've got some input, uh, images, you do some processing uh, of them, um, uh, then some uh, further processing. Um, after you've done the analysis, you do, in this case, rendering, and then uh, you distribute the results. Uh, perhaps, you know, it could be pushing the data to a, uh, a public uh, repository or, or, or making it available to uh, people in some other way. And this is implemented as a, as a, a cloud native application. So all state is stored in uh, uh, an object store, the Amazon S3 object store. And then there's a set of virtual machines, varying numbers of them over time that handle things like interact upload, data upload, um, uh, the analysis, the rendering and, and distribution. Um, if nothing is happening, maybe no virtual machines are, are instantiated or perhaps just one of each. As load increases, then uh, more virtual machines are provided. Um, you'll see a, a reference here to a service called Amazon, Amazon SQS. This is the simple queuing service, which is one of a, a number of similar services operated by different cloud providers that uh, basically does what, it, what you would think. It, it operates a queue uh, into which uh, you know, requests to do things can be placed and from which um, uh, say a virtual machine can can extract uh, uh, elements. Um, so uh, cloud native is, uh, as I said, increasingly the way that people build um, applications. So if you simply want to analyze some data of your own, you're not going to be particularly concerned about cloud native. But if you want to create a service that will uh, analyze lots of data for lots of people, uh, then you might well want to structure it uh, as in the in the form that uh, I've just uh, shown you, uh, and um, you know this is increasingly easy to do given the capabilities that are operated offered by the various cloud providers. One uh, uh, interesting step beyond cloud native is is what people call uh, function as a service. So you know in the example I just showed you, we have uh, these virtual machines. You create the virtual machine. Uh, it runs some basic logic. You know, wait for a task to be available, uh, do some computation, store the result back into uh, into 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 storage. Um, sorry, wrong way. Uh, in what's called function as a service, uh, the whole need to create and manage these virtual machines uh, is automated. So that all one has to do is simply specify a function that you want to have executed when certain events occur. Um, and so, for example, uh, here is a, a simple here's a simple example. Um, this is a function that responds to uh, events, uh, messages appearing uh, on this 
system I mentioned briefly earlier, Kinesis. Um, so this, you know, the event might be that a new image is available from an instrument in your lab. We're using it, uh, Kinesis, for this uh, purpose at Argon. Um, and uh, each time a, uh, such an event happens, we've configured this function so that it will be executed, being passed the details of the event and some context. And uh, if you don't need to read the details, but what you'll see it does is it uh, um, uh, reaches inside the event, grabs some information, and then loads it uh, into a, uh, a, a database, uh, a, a Dynamo DB database. So yeah, 15 lines or so of code, I've uh, specified what needs to happen whenever uh, uh, data is processed, is, is generated by an instrument in my lab. And I don't need to uh, be worrying about managing virtual machines or scaling up the number of virtual machines and, and so forth. I just need to specify the function. Um, okay, getting to I've got sort of one more topic I want to cover and then we'll wrap up. So uh, one of the things that um, we as scientists can do with uh, with cloud is to use it to provide services to others, um, you know, to other scientists. Um, and uh, that my group at Chicago does this. We offer a, operate a service called Globus, um, which uh, provides some capabilities for research data management. And specifically, I show here two of them, uh, the ability to, to manage the transfer of data uh, from, for example, a sequencing center to cloud storage or to your institutional storage, uh, and then manage uh, who's allowed to access that data, sharing uh, of that data. Um, and this Globus software is actually a cloud native uh, service. It runs on Amazon. So every time you make a request to it, uh, it there's a message gets queued in a similar fashion to what I showed a few minutes ago. Um, this It's dequeued. A, uh, transfer is uh, negotiated um, and managed uh, uh, as a, and and uh, tracked uh, as it proceeds. Um, if uh, we specify, if you request that certain data be shared with other people and uh, you know, similar various tables will be updated to reflect the fact that uh, some other user is allowed, to, is allowed to access your data. The data itself doesn't need to go near the cloud, it's just the control logic that runs. Uh, very reliably and securely on Amazon because that's what cloud uh, platforms are, are good for. And like any other um, cloud service, there's a web interface um, uh, which looks a bit like this, but there's also uh, uh, Python APIs. So you can you know, say that I want to move data from one computer to another by uh, using this submit transfer request and then waiting for it to complete if, if that is what I want to do. Okay, so um, that is a very brief uh, re review of cloud computing and why it matters for data science. So just to remind you, um, the cloud is, uh, you can view it as a virtual computer where you can manage data and perform computing. You can also view it as a platform that you can link into your own applications that you can use to build new sorts of applications. Uh, that uh, you know, for, that perform things like that data analytics, management of streaming data, machine learning, uh, data movement, and so forth, um, without having to uh, deploy a, a lot of complex software on your own uh, local computers. Um, so, uh, why, therefore, does the cloud matter for data science? Well, these are my the the, the reasons that occurred to me. You may have uh, others. Um, it certainly provides you with on-demand computing and storage. Um, of course, it comes at a price. You do have to pay for these services, but for many computing uh, applications, the costs are modest um, relative to the uh, time that you might spend uh, meeting those costs in other ways. Um, you can get access to specialized hardware, certainly, you know, graphical processing units and so forth. Um, what I find most exciting, of course, is this rich collection of platform services that let you build uh, new classes of applications, for example, using this cloud native programming model. Uh, and you can do these things in a way that achieves uh, scalability. 
you know, high availability, but you'll read occasionally about um, uh, events when the cloud services become inaccessible, but that's, uh, they're only news because they're so rare. Um, they're certainly more available than any computing platform that I, I have access to uh, at any uh, institution uh, or, or lab uh, that I might work with. And, and similarly for security, uh, you've got very complex uh, and uh, sophisticated systems in place to uh, manage the security of these uh, platforms. Increasingly, people are using them, in fact, to uh, manage uh, uh, data uh, and, and so forth and, and finding that works well for them. Okay, so uh, I think that's uh, my last slide. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Ian. That was a great overview of uh, cloud computing and, and why it should, <clears throat> excuse me, matter for, for data science. Um, a couple of, I would like to ask uh, folks who are, are listening in, so if you do have any questions for, for Dr. Foster, to please uh, submit them via the question submission system, and I'll do my best to get to them. Uh, one question that uh, we had, you mentioned it sort of at the end there, and I think it's probably worth some further uh uh, thoughts from you is the notion of security and whether you know just at a time kind of when people are getting used to the notion of cloud um, computing um, we're starting to see some sort of bad examples of uh, you know potential security issues I know there was a issue with a couple of things that go by the terms of meltdown and Spectre uh, which sounds you know terrible um, what sort of implications do these types of things and other security issues have for compute uh, cloud computing Computing and people's and institutions, I guess, comfort with it. Uh, well, yeah, those are good questions. Um, I mean, my view is, uh, in general, that you know, a cloud computing platform is going to be more secure than any institution's uh, computing platform, simply because there are more, more. Uh, more people, more highly trained people, um, you know, more sophisticated people managing security in a place like uh, Amazon. Um, there, uh, there are, um, you know, these recent uh, events that you mentioned are certainly uh, of concern. I think they're concerned for anyone using, oops, uh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, Anyone who's using computers anywhere, I think the, I'm sure the cloud vendors are on, on, on top of them. Uh, there are, uh, you know, versions of, I should also mention, you know, there are uh, different levels of security in um, the, the cloud. Uh, there are some of the things that one has to worry about in your, in your local computers. You also have to worry about there. Um, you have to make sure that you're, Running, you know, the, the right, the latest version of software that's important. Um, there are uh, different uh, levels of um, different. For example, Amazon runs you know, the regular cloud and also um, uh, Gov Cloud, uh, which is um, you know, designed for highly uh, secure um, data that, for example, can't leave the country. Uh, and so you also need to be aware, aware of what the capabilities are that uh, that they make, they make available to you. Of course. So you're based in part at Argonne National Laboratory, which I presume is involved in a lot of atom smashing and, and other sorts of, uh, of uh, particle physics and, and other types of things. And I imagine that you've got a lot of experience in examples of physics and astronomy and possibly working with CERN and other major organizations looking at you know, either the very small or the very distant. Um, maybe you could say a couple of comments on that and what's kind of come out of some of your interactions with those folks. And also if you've been doing any stuff that uh, has biomedical relevance that uh, people might be interested in hearing about. Uh, well, so you know, it's looking particularly at, at Argon, um, there's, we, one, one of one thing that we, one, one area that we spend a fair bit of time on is, is working with uh, uh, specialized experimental facilities like the Advanced Photon Source, uh, which, you know, high energy X-ray source. It uh, runs uh, a number of beam lines, a number of which are specialized for uh, biomedical uh, or 
biological applications, you know, crystallography, uh, tomography, um, other methods, and in increasingly, you know, they're finding that they they need high performance computing, uh, or at least on demand computing, to uh, to enable instantaneous analysis of data as it is collected rather than as was used to be the, the case you know sending the data home uh, on a uh, usb uh, drive or i guess floppy disk in the old days um and so uh, we're, we're finding that they um, need these sorts of uh, computing models that i was been talking about here and in fact we're starting to use a mix of cloud services to uh, manage and dispatch computations and uh and then uh, high performance computing facilities at Argon to uh, actually do the data reduction, the data analysis, and, and so forth. Uh, a number of these um, you know, increasingly have a, a sort of a, a machine learning component to them, uh, you know, perhaps for uh, detecting uh, errors or labeling uh, data. And so uh, we're finding that our computing facilities at Argon are starting to evolve from something that's that are things that have been focused almost exclusively on simulation to increasingly being used for data analysis, learning, um, and, and so forth. And that's that's one of the reasons why we recently established the uh, data science and learning division at Argon, which we're just setting up at the moment and which will be focused on those sorts of applications. Oh, that's great. Um, one thing that uh, someone had asked about is when you were discussing the ENCODE project, you mentioned uh, something about the BD bags um, and the, the Bagot methodology. Do um, you care to elaborate a little bit more on that and uh, kind of when, is, is there some easy way to know when you might want to use that? Yeah, so um, this is something that came out of uh, the, the BD bag uh, stands for big data bag, and I think, we, well, maybe we don't need to look at the slide, but uh, one of the slides showed us exchanging data between phases of a computation um, using this notation. It's, uh, it's a set of conventions that originally came out of the library community, uh, the so-called Bagot uh, specification. Um, it's, it's a very lightweight uh, set of, uh, rules and functions for uh, bundling up a, a some data and associated metadata all in terms of files and a defined uh, uh, file system structure um, and using uh, JSON format to uh, represent uh, metadata checksums and others such uh, information um, we uh, developed this in collaboration with people at USC um, and uh, we find that you know whenever we have um, a computation that involves multiple phases where one phase uh, we might want to run produce some data and then perhaps run the other phase uh, later or on a different computer it works well to uh, bundle up the results in this bd bag uh, uh, format um, and we've got some some nice tools have been now been developed by the community for uh, managing these uh, BD bags for uh, checking the integrity of the data in them using the checksums for retrieving uh, elements uh, of a BD bag when the contents are not uh, the actual file but a URL. Um, uh, we have uh, Galaxy uh, tools for uh, accessing and, and lonely pipeline tools for accessing uh, for processing data contained in these BD bags uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, Ian, we're almost at the end of our time here, but I want to give you a minute or two here just to kind of forecast where you see grid and cloud computing in the next five years. Will we be like dispensing with doing local computing altogether and just shipping it out to the ether? Um, or do you see any alterations that how's it going to change our lives in the next five years? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good, good question. So the, of course, we'll still have uh, academic computing centers, um, but they will perhaps be more focused on the very high end simulations that and, and other computations that can't be performed on cloud computing platforms. I, 
you think, you know, particularly for smaller institutions, they need to be, you know, looking very hard at where does it make sense to compute locally versus remotely and, uh, you know, looking at doing sort of a full cost uh, analysis um, and, and also trying to understand the trade-offs involved in, uh, you know, having to uh, maintain and, uh, and then compete for time on a overloaded local system versus uh, being able to reach out to uh, a, a cloud service. Um, but then, you know, the other, I think the area where we hopefully will see great progress is in, in the services that are operated on cloud platforms for scientists. Uh, we're seeing a, you know, a growing number of these, um, but I think we can go much further. Um, you know, the cloud in one form or another will hopefully be the place where we can process, you know, the data about millions of patients that's starting to become available um, uh, from various uh, programs in the US and, and abroad. It's seems impractical to imagine every institution setting up the machinery required to uh, you know, collect, to create a copy of a million genomes and analyze them. Um, but uh, a central cloud hosted facility could quite feasibly be used for that purpose. Well, we'll look forward to that time. But uh, we've reached the end of our time though today. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Ian Foster from the University of Chicago and Argonne National Laboratories once again for telling us why the cloud matters for data science. And I wanna thank everybody who joined us today for tuning in to the Big Data to Knowledge Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science. Uh, once again, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Foster. And everybody have a wonderful uh, extra long weekend. And we'll, we'll see you again for the next BD2K Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science uh, next week. Thanks, everybody. Take care.